All right, shout out to everyone. 12 takeaways from Tesla's energy department. And I think this is going to be a very good sighted one. So let's just dive right into it. Shout outs to Sawyer. Sawyer is always giving us the information and the source that we need. Let me bring this up on the big screen, guys. All right, here. New Sanders had an analysis recently hosted two Tesla related events to deep dive into the company's evolving strategies in both the energy and storage and autonomous driving. So we're just going to focus on the energy storage right now. We're going to look at the mega pack facility visit takeaway. So Chinese companies are ramping up competition in the stationary battery market, but demand remains strong globally. So we do have some competition coming from China, but in my opinion, besides CATL, that's all we have. Of course, BYD is a battery maker too. So their competition but in the whole of China, as far as the competition is there, it's coming and it's arriving, but we're actually in the lead when it comes down to that. We'll be the first one outside of the United States to actually build this mega factory where we're going to be manufacturing our batteries. But the global demand is serious, and that's pretty good. And this follows up on the next point. By 2030, the market will need approximately two terawatt hours of batteries. That's a 20-fold increase from 2023 levels, 20-fold increase. So that's 10x, you know, 10 for Tesla and 10 for BYD and CATL. Shout out to them. So, of course, it's not going to go down like that, but that could be a conservative estimation. Even Look, I'll take a 5% fold increase. That sounds good to me. Let's move into the next. As battery technology matures, hardware could become a commodity and Tesla won't be able to compete solely on price. The investment bank stated. Now, I don't agree on that because... We might not be able to compete on price because of subsidiaries that are provided from China and their government to the actual private companies. But we have our own government that could help us and facilitate some subsidies and incentives. Not only on top of that, we know how to cut back the prices. When we actually implement artificial intelligence, we're starting a refinery lithium ion inside of Texas, right? That's uh, Texas Corpus, Corpus Texi, Chrissy, Texas, whatever. <laughs> it's over there. So we're building out our facilities. Now, it hasn't finished out yet, and it's going to be a long process, but the margins when actually refining lithium is very good. So it's beneficial for Tesla to have that vertical integration. So we look for vertical in integration and then innovation to solve our cost or our expense problem, which will allow us to comp compete in the global market. Now, let's go to the next one. To win contracts, Tesla leverages its full ecosystem, including software and inverters, rather than focusing on offering the lowest prices. See, once again, our ecosystem, which is vertical integration, and our software allows us to compete, not only just by lowering prices and having the lowest price, but also having the best product and a fully holistic product that people can enjoy. And then, of course, vertical integration helps us you know, execute that type of plan. And Chinese competitors are largely absent from the U.S. market, partly because of the long-term assets requiring ongoing service. So, of course, the services after you purchase the vehicle might not be as accessible for BYD and any other Chinese manufacturers in the United States. But Tesla does have to get better at its servicing vehicles after you purchase them. That's something that everybody knows that it needs to just become a little bit better. It's not the worst, but it's not the best. And next point is geopolitical factors in the location of factories pose challenges for Chinese suppliers in the U.S. market. And so geopolitical issues are always a factor, but both companies, even just Chinese suppliers or just the EV companies, always attempt to strategically place their factories. And this is why recently Tesla has halted on its Mexico facility and factory because we don't know what the tariffs and the restrictions are going to be imposed by either administration coming up in the next presidential election. Now we move to the next point. We got mega packs can weigh over 80,000 pounds, making shipping costly and highlighting the importance of local production. Production, excuse me. So we have our factory out there in California and we're allowed to facilitate deals in the Western Hemisphere. Um, 80,000 pounds shipping it across the world is a little bit more complex and expensive and costly. And then we have the facility which is being built out in China and China does have an excellent system for exporting for the region. So they have a favoritism and better actual agreements when things are manufactured in China and get shipped, for an example, to Thailand. So this is something good. Tesla shipped from China. That's a little to no talks. But 
any other car globally shipped to Thailand has 300%, 300% of foreign cars being imported to Thailand versus China, which is extremely lower. Let's just cap it at 100 to be conservative. And I don't even think it's that. Let's go to the next point. The new facility in Shanghai, expected to be online in 2025, will help Tesla compete more effectively in the Asian market. This is true. Now, competition is there in the Asian market, but the facility in Shanghai should be online, at least kind of ramping up products in 2023. And again, guys, this is for the energy, okay? This is not for EVs or anything else. And Tesla Energy operates on a project basis, leading to fluctuations in quarterly results, which makes long-term forecasting challenging. It is difficult to forecast it because every project has a different type of you know, time date on completion. It's not something that could be projected on a reasonable quarterly basis just because of construction, especially when it comes and it involves an infrastructure. It could be so volatile and the projects can be delayed through regulation, bureaucracy, red tape, or just technicalities. And so again, the biggest issue is the technicalities, the bureaucracy and the red tape that comes into play. And it's a complex project. It's not as simple to execute even with a supportive local government. It's very, uh, you know, detailed about how you do it. It's not simple as just purchasing a car <laughs> or supercharger network, right? That's even more simpler. And Tesla currently imports lithium ion phosphate LFP cells and did not comment on the potential of in-house production using CATL machines. And of course, this is why I talked about the facility, the refining plant that we're building out in Texas. So this will allow us to vertically integrate, which you know will reduce our expenses for operation and the cost of goods and services. Next point is Tesla's strategy focuses on localizing and insourcing production to prepare for various potential market scenarios. And of course, that localization, that vertical integration allows us to compete in the market that is volatile, right? Semiconductors. We were able to rewrite our own semiconductors and our chips and repurpose them. When we're dealing with actual interest rates increase, we were able to lower our interest rates because we have a finance department. When it, the market became cyclical in the low season for selling vehicles, we were able to reduce our prices on our vehicle due to our larger margins than even just traditional automakers and EV automakers. So these are the advantages that Tesla has within their company. Next and last point, Tesla's energy long-term gross target or margin target aligns with other segments at approximately 20%. And hopefully over the time period, we can work that down to even be in a smaller percentage. So there's many upsides and benefits to Tesla, as I always say, but you guys have been able to see point by point that we're talking about the energy department and how it has competition with the Chinese competitors and also how we're going to excel. But I think these are 12 takeaways that are very interesting and are very important to remember in the macro when you're doing the analysis or you're just evaluating this company and seeing, hey, what's the potential for the energy department and segment? I'm not going to mostly get into FSD because in my opinion, I'm not even calculating it into my analysis. It's just a cherry on top. From here, I'm looking at things that actually generate revenue, the here and now, and that's cars and energy. And there's massive amounts of room to grow in the energy. If the Optimus grow by, and then also the FSD come through, all the better. And I'm not saying it won't. I believe Elon Musk will execute and find a way. But at the end of the day, this is what's in black and white. And with that being said, that's why I stamp my flag. Anything else? Is speculation. I agree. But at the end of the day, come on, don't bet against Elon. Everyone hates Tesla. Nothing new. I see you guys on the next one. I decided to get a different type of studio vibe going on. Still, it's basic. I just came in here just an hour ago and I started shooting content immediately. So here we go. I'm going to keep giving you guys the content day by day. I see you on the next one. Peace. Stop hating on Tesla. It's not a good look for you guys. I'm killing you. The statistics.